You're in the place where mysteries and the missing meet. Where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm queer. I'm queer. And I'm queer. That's true. Fact. <laughs> it would be weird if we had lied about that this whole time. So today we're going to be talking about History is Trans Confirmed, and the next installment of our ongoing series, Secret Queer History. For those of you who are wondering, what does this have to do with your normal content? Well, first of all, it's Pride Month, and so there is there such thing as normal content? But second of all, everything is a conspiracy. But most definitely, public education is a conspiracy. <laughs> Our goal with this series is to learn about queer people throughout history that you didn't know were queer, and some of them even were persecuted in ways for being queer, but even though they're famous, it's never really brought up. The biggest conspiracy is that queer is new. It's so true, though, especially yeah. as we're going to talk about in secret trans history, because I think people are like, OK, well, maybe there was gay people for a long time, but there haven't been trans people for a long time. This is just a new thing that started in the Bullshit. Ho, ho, ho. 2010s. Bullshit. <laughs> oh, my dear listeners, just you prepare. But before we get started, content warning, this is about transgender oppression and we're going to be talking about rape and murder, and microaggressions like misgendering. So if that's bad for you, we get it. Please don't listen. Or wait until you are at a place where you can't listen. Emotionally, physically. Mentally. Spiritually. We also want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Podgo. Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much to get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today, become a member, and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit to your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. And be sure to add our podcast in the how did you hear about Podgo section of the application. Podgo, of course, is one of the main ways that we get our sponsorship. Another sort of note here at the beginning, we tried to, and we will eventually have an episode about the murder of trans women of color that is rampant in our society. But it turns out those aren't very well publicized. And so it's really hard to find that sort of information. You'll know a name and you'll know some things in the case, but the information is never as detailed as a lot of the information we can get our hands on with other cases. And we just want to make sure that we're able to do it justice and not do a half ass job. So we're going to have a little sampler platter of trans people of history, and then we'll focus on my personal favorite, Polly Murray. But before that, let's talk about pronouns. Pronouns restoring to historical figures. You'll hear me rant about this a few more times in this episode. There's this habit, there's this rule of using the clearly wrong pronouns for a person. Sometimes just they said explicitly, hey, <laughs> I am a woman, call me she. But even when, in this case of Paul Murray, when we go back, it's so clear that he was a trans man. It's so clear. But even historians who admit that he was probably a trans man still choose to use she. Ugh. And it's infuriating and baffling. Mm. How depressed am I going to be? Um, there'll be some big highs and big lows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's start with one, Frances Thompson. Frances Thompson was uh, the first trans woman that we know of to testify in front of Congress. In 1866, there was the Memphis riots, where a group of white men just terrorized a black neighborhood in Memphis for days. And Frances Thomas and Lucy Smith, who were roommates... Lovers? Gals being pals? I don't know. There were no answers to that question. Frances Thomas and Lucy Smith were raped as punishment for supporting Union soldiers. Because, you know, it's so weird that black women would, you know, support the Union side of that war. Well, but, we started with the lows. <laughs> You're yeah. not disappointing. I'm no. glad that I've managed my expectations. But she testified in Congress. Was the testifying in Congress over the assault and yeah, rape? Yeah. 
It was okay. Hey, Memphis was terrorized. These men raped us. Yeah, right. For Frances Thompson, it didn't go well because a decade later she was outed as being trans, and people tried to like discredit her testimony based on that. <sighs> what? Like she couldn't be raped because she was trans? She's lying, clearly. Or because she was trans, she wasn't even a credible voice. Yeah. She's, it's really Ugh. a man in a dress. No one would rape a man, and he's a liar. Shut up. Shut up, history. I really hope that you have went high, low, high, low. <laughs> well, m- the next one, it's funny. <laughs> it's a low, it's a medium low. Great. Let's jump to 1393 in England. Eleanor Reichener. Eleanor Reichener was arrested for sodomy, and she was having sex with a man, and they arrested her and charged with sodomy and, you know, sort of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> disorderly conduct sort of thing. They, I misspoke. They didn't charge her. But I wanted to include this solely for this quote at the beginning of their interrogation, which translates to John Reichener calling himself Eleanor, having been detected in women's clothing. But the rest of this is sort of a mystery. There, There's no records of her having been actually charged. It was just this interrogation. But it's from 1393, so those records are probably just lost. But these records actually lasted from 1393. So that's, that's interesting. Wow. That's actually really amazing that source material about something like this would last that long. It was misfiled, and that's partially why. I don't remember what it was filed with. Isn't that always the case? MK Ultra, like, there's so many, you ain't lying. so many instances on this show where the only reason we know about something is because it was either misfiled or it was lost somehow in some way and then found much later. Yeah. Conspiracies. They're only proven true because their mistakes were made. Let's jump to Dr. James Berry who in 1826 performed the first cesarean section as a European in Africa, where both the mother and child survived. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, he was trans. He uh, passed his entire life and only was outed after his death. Were there any Victorian female doctors at the time? Nope. Being a He's doctor right. was a men's profession for a long time, and women would could just be nurses. He was trans, and he passed. <laughs> and passing is why he got to be a doctor. Wow, Similar note. crazy. Okay. So, uh, I'm assuming he moved from his childhood home kind of thing, or his family kept it a secret of some sort? I'm not sure about his family. I just know no one knew. And he, he hmm. you know, he traveled. I think he, yeah, he was in the army. So, he traveled a lot as army. That's interesting, though, that he was in the military. Yep. And they didn't discover that because don't they go through rigorous like uh, physicals and things of that nature? Probably not at the time, though. Yeah, maybe I'm just thinking modernly. I mean, it's certainly something even then. It was a very regimented army. We're in 1826. We're not talking 2600 BCE. But I mean, in terms of the way that they would do a physical examination, a lot of times it would just be like, if you're a quote unquote able bodied. Yeah, but like just checking your heart and your breathing and stuff, you're going to, you know, if he, if he still had, you know, breasts or smaller breasts, like I feel like in, in just a standard physical. I know a lot of cis men with breasts, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. He was very svelte. That's true. <laughs> He was one of those tiny trans men. (laughs) Similar note, Dr. Alan Hart, who in the 1930s pioneered the development of using x-rays to detect tuberculosis. Which is still used today. Sometimes when students get a false positive on their TB test, they have to give us proof of an x-ray test showing that they don't actually have it. At what point did they find out about Dr. Hart? Well, he was also the first known trans man to have a hysterectomy and live probably. Oh, so it's wow. not necessarily out, but he was not it, closeted quite to the extent yeah. he, as he was, previously because he was having surgery. So, so some people did know, at least. At least some people knew, unlike James Berry, who was passing the whole fucking time. 
as far as we could tell. And where was where was this in retrospect to Dr. Barry? Like, was this in America or was this? He in... was in the United States. I forget which state hired him, but he went around like Wyoming or some somewhere over there, some nowhere town, performing these x-rays to help diagnose. Interesting. That's really cool. Thanks, Alan Hart. His directomies directly benefit me. <laughs> then in 1320, we have Colonymus. Colonymus was a Jewish sort of scholar, professor, uh, philosopher, poet, that sort of thing. And she <laughs> wrote a poem where she lamented being born a boy instead of a woman. Spelled it right out there in Hebrew, so I can't read it. <laughs> Just to quote this piece, Father in heaven who did miracles for our ancestors with fire and water, you changed the fire of Chaldees so it would burn hot. You changed Dina in the womb of her mother to a girl. You changed the staff to a snake before a million eyes. You changed Moses' hand to leprous white and the sea to dry land. In the desert, you turned rock to water, hard flint to a fountain. Who would then turn me from a man to a woman? Were I only to have merited this, being so graced by your goodness? Wow. Man, I really hate my monthlies. That's not that, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. No. No, that's directly calling out a creator for making a mistake. That's what that is. Further down, so I will bear and suffer until I die and wither in the ground. And since I have learned from the tradition that we bless both the good and the bitter, I will bless in a voice hushed and weak. Blessed are you, O Lord, who has not made me a woman. Wow. It's fucking tragic. <laughs> Got me it's fucked so up. I said there are lows. <laughs> yeah, that's be it's beautiful and tragic all at the same time. 1320. Trans is new. Trans is a fad. Trans is a millennial Zoomer invention. That was sarcasm if you couldn't tell, audience. Also a note from this same article, and it quotes directly from this article, which is from Cully Press. And this is actually from the Wayback Machine, so who knows if the article is still live. But it says, Judaism has traditionally recognized six different genders, but it was the rabbis that determined a person's gender. And whatever gender you were responsible, uh, were assigned is what you were stuck with. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Moving on. In France, around the United States Revolutionary War and, you know, the overthrow of the king sort of thing, um, there was Chevalier d'Eon. What'd you say? Pass the Cavassier? <sighs> That's what I heard. So, Chevalier d'Eon worked as a spy for King Louis XV, and then also was a soldier in the Seven Years' War, and got a pension and fun things like that. But then, because there's drama in the French-English existence that I don't understand, uh, she was demoted and punished and sort of exiled. And in response to this, she published some of her very secret spy records to the world, and... It was, quote, scandalous to the point of being unheard of. Yes. But she hadn't published everything yet, so the French government uh, treaded lightly. She was still exiled to London. After King Louis XV dies, she negotiates a 23-page treaty with France in order to be allowed back into France and regain her pension. From that point... She identified as a woman and lived entirely as a woman and demanded recognition by the government as a woman for the rest of her life. Wow. wow. Uh, honestly, the most, sh I mean, the most shocking thing about that, though, is that France didn't just charge her with treason. Right. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. What did she have that she hadn't published yet? Well, that's probably why. Yeah, I'm saying. What did dirt did she have? She probably had so much dirt on France that she was like, look, you're letting me back in and you're going to recognize me as a woman or else I'm putting this all out in public. Do you want that? You see, I did it. I'll make good on this threat. Give me my money. And also, I'm going to wear a dress. Fuck you. Good for her. And she wasn't murdered or anything like that that I know of. Oh, what a high. Yeah, we needed that, didn't we? <laughs> She's my favorite, obviously. <laughs> Uh, you haven't heard this last one yet. We have the public universal friend. 
the public universal friend was a person in the United States around the Revolutionary War. And in 1776, the friend was reborn. A previous sole owner of the body uh, got sick with a fever, and it was probably typhus. And when the body rose, it was, in fact, the public universal friend. The public universal friend, the friend, did not ever respond to the dead name. I am very confusion. The friend was sent back by God into this body and then traveled mostly in New England, preaching the good word. Okay, so they basically changed their name to the Fred. The public universal friend. The, the friend didn't even use they pronouns most of the time. It was the friend. I know that we, to some extent, and only we can do it, right? But to some extent, queer people razz other queer people when they change their name because it's it's just always a little extra. Um, what can you do, Chip? Jaden, Caden. Yeah, it's always that kind of a uh, very hipstery upper middle class name that is chosen. It's, it either rhymes with Aiden, it's one syllable like Kai, or it's a word. Shut up. But the the friend, the the public universal friend? The public universal friend or the friend is just the most extra shit I have ever heard in my whole life. So, they got sick with fever. They arose as being genderless and identified as public universal friend and was sent from God. Yes. Okay. How come there's not a musical about this, like Book of Mormon? I'd watch this. <laughs> yeah, Hamilton. I, I don't understand. Why wasn't public universal friend in Hamilton? So the previous owner of the friend's body, their whole family was sort of uh, exiled from Quakerism and didn't do so good with the, the church. So the friend started a new sect. It was just the, the Society of Universal Friends. And so the friend traveled the country, mostly New England, but also other places, preaching their new sect teachings. The teachings mostly focused on free will, good, anti-slavery, very good, women's rights, hell yeah, and abstinence. Mm, you lost me. <laughs> and we're done. Uh, uh, <laughs> you are no friend of mine, public universal friend. <laughs> we're acquaintances. <laughs> The friend was also very meh on marriage. If you're gonna have extramarital sex, that's still worse than not being... It's it's fine. Whatever. Um, the friend refused to acknowledge the dead name in any capacity, including when the friend needed to sign legal documents, the friend just put an X. If you wanted to witness that, and just... Yep, we testify that the friend wrote that X. It was to the point that some historians thought the friend was illiterate. Also, sometimes they were called Puff. I doubt they pronounced it as Puff. They probably just spelled it out P-U-F, but also, I'm calling my friend Puff. <laughs> my fun little anecdote for the public universal friend that I felt compelled to, I must include this, is that I feel like the friend might have murdered someone. There was this couple, Sarah and Abraham Richards, and they had a very unhappy marriage until Abraham died while visiting the friend. After oh. Abraham died... Sarah and her daughter moved in with the friend, and Sarah started being androgynous, and, you know, started dressing in the sort of androgynous way the friend did, and was then called Sarah Friend. And Sarah Friend became sort of the legal owner of property in place of public universal friend. So I just need to call it like I see it. Puff was a cult leader. They, sure, will use they, even though they specifically used thou, they would quote Luke 23 3, which is thou sayest it, saying like neither male or female using thou instead of now we would use right. they. So right. they said that they're a prophet. They started preaching. They gained followers. Their followers would become like them, in this case, Friends. being androgynous. And they were a cult leader. <laughs> Like and dude. possibly killed someone who had an issue. And possibly with it. killed somebody. <laughs> I'm fine with it. I bet Abraham Richards was a, an abuser. Didn't find out. Didn't care. Focused on Sarah Friend and Public Universal Friends. Was there any background as to their relationship before this? Nah, 
Nope. Abraham was visiting the friend. I just really like that public universal friend in my fan fiction murdered someone and stole the wife. <laughs> it's definitely an interesting story and definitely Excellent. needs to be made into a musical. When someone asked if the friend was male or female, the preacher replied, I am that I am. I just respect getting people to call you public universal friend in fucking 17, 1800s. Good for you, Puff. You do you. Be a cult leader. Murder abusive husbands. I don't think anyone ever drank Kool-Aid. It was about free will and anti-slavery and women's rights and absolutes. And no sex, Chip. Don't no, don't no. forget that. Yeah. I'm not Sarah that's, Friend. That's... I don't have to sign up for the abstinence. You really just want to gloss over and and be like, I'm sure that guy was an abuser because I really just want public universal friend to be my friend. I want to join the universal friends yeah. group. But but I would have been like, um, public universal slut. Hi, nice uh, to meet you. And your abstinence has to that's go That's your somewhere. name now, Puss. Like, up <laughs> Goodbye, my ass. Mikey. Hello, Puss. <laughs> Hello, Puss. Well, yes, I am a public universal slut. Thank you for asking. The abstinence was probably for the best, just because, you know, cults and sex don't, don't usually fare well together. But murder's okay. The friend probably <laughs> did murder Abraham. I ha I saw no mm -hmm. records to technically indicate as such. It's just a little weird that he died when visiting the friend, and then Sarah friend and moved in with the friend, and everyone were friends. Yeah. Well, I wonder if he was sick, and that's why he went to. That's why the friend went to go visit him to begin with, but probably. That makes sense. <laughs> Probably, I want to take that because I don't want the friend to be a murderer cult leader. <laughs> I'm fine with the murderer cult leader bit. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Also, when Sarah friend died, they did leave their daughter uh, in the custody of the friend. So, you know, as far as gals being pals are concerned, the friend is not a gal, but Sarah sure is a pal. So we're all changing our names, our last names to friend now, right? Slut. <laughs> well, Mikey's oh. a slut. <laughs> oh. Our family name is Public Universal. It's an it's a uh, it's, it's not as fun. And so that was your sampler platter of trans is not a new thing. But this episode, it's actually about Polly Murray. There are two conspiracies regarding Polly Murray. The first is you've never heard of him. The second is if you've heard of him, you think he's a woman. Turns out he did exist, and he wasn't a woman. Summary of his life, and then we'll get to my list of evidence. On November 10th, 1910, Murray was born in Baltimore with the incredibly wrong name, Anne Pauline Murray, which he would kick to the curb in his early 20s. His mother died when he was three, and afterwards his father became too unstable to raise his kid, so he sent Polly to live with his maternal grandparents and aunt in North Carolina. When Polly was 12, his father was committed to the Crownsville State Hospital for the Negro Insane. His father received no treatment, and a year later, in 1922, was beaten to death by a guard with a baseball bat. Holy Jesus. crap. Yeah, there are some lows here. <sighs> you think? I mentioned this just because Polly once said that the most significant fact of his childhood was that he was an orphan. As a kid, Murray was what the old people call a firecracker. He was smart and stubborn, very motivated, and he supposedly taught himself to read when he was five and then devoured books from that moment on. Even as a kid, he was resisting segregation and hating everything by refusing to ride in street cards at all, would just walk places, and refused to go to segregated movie theaters. In 1930, when Murray was 20, he married a man, William Wynn. Entire marriage and honeymoon was basically a blink. They, their honeymoon was a bad time, and Murray wrote, a, Whenever men try to have sex with me, something inside me fights. Which is not necessarily trans guy. This is just not attracted to men. But the marriage did not last. After a few months, the two of them separated and would not speak again until 1949 when they had it officially annulled. Just before the Great Depression hits, Murray is going to college. He wanted to go to Columbia University, but they didn't admit women. He wanted to go to Barnard College, which was a women's college, but he couldn't afford it. So in the end, he went to Hunter College, which was a free city college that was black primarily. Despite the Great Depression, he managed to graduate, but then during the whole Great Depression, he basically just bounced around the whole country 
doing random odd jobs and not always making ends meet. It was a bad time for everyone. The unemployment rate was 25%. So in 1938, he decides to go to grad school. He applies to the University of North Carolina, and they unshockingly deny because he was black. The NAACP wouldn't take his case. Didn't want to use him as a, a model case because he wasn't a, a good defendant. He was too undiplomatic, quote unquote, because at the time he wrote to various authorities involved, such as the president of the university and also the president of the country, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And then when he got the replies that were too bad, you're black, he published them in an attempt to shame them. It was very undiplomatic of him. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. And he was way too queer. Even if you pretend he's a woman, she was way, way too queer. <laughs> In 1940, Murray and a friend refused to move from the white seating on a segregated bus and were arrested. Rosa Parks did it in 1955. I'm talking about Rosa Parks because a lot of these articles all do this sort of very dismissive thing of like, oh, Murray was doing bus sit-ins before it was cool. That's gross. It is gross. But equally, yeah. there were a lot of, of bus sit-ins <laughs> before Rosa Parks that I feel like when Rosa Parks did it, when we learned it later in history, not being alive right. at the time, it was that Rosa Parks did this thing that no one had ever done before. And that's just not true. She was an activist purposefully doing mm -hmm. it. And that doesn't Correct. make it less worthy of praise. Right. However, there are other people that started the movement that deserved equal praise. It's cooler that she was an activist, <laughs> even though, like, doing these deliberate things, and it works. It helped work. Also, I got this image of, like, this sweet old lady who just, she's very proud, and she won't move across the bus. She was only 42, it turns out. <laughs> It was not yeah, and they're like, she was tired. <laughs> I, I yeah. just remember that being, she of was racism. on her way back from work, and she was, she was tired, and her feet hurt. Like, I remember hearing that whole spiel, yeah. which is just made-up nonsense. It's just yeah. made-up nonsense. She was very tired. It wasn't from work. Also, holy shit, Rosa Parks died in 2005, and I did not know it was that reason. Oh, yeah. I no yeah, idea. There is a... a giant funeral for her i believe you i don't remember it well i live in detroit she was 92 good for her back to polly murray once again the naacp would not defend murray's case and also the charges were formally disorderly conduct which was much less helpful than breaking segregation Around that time, Murray is working for the Workers' Defense League. Involvement with a case, of, there's a few different cases, but he wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, and then they were friends for the rest of their lives, until Eleanor died. What the fuck do you mean he was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, and I've never That's heard suspicious. his name? <laughs> That's suspicious. If you remember from our last episode, Secret Gay History from last year, you will recall that Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. was very queer and surrounded herself with very queer people. Yeah. History is queer confirmed. In 1941, he starts attending Howard University Law School. He was the only many, many air quotes woman in the class. And supposedly, this is an anecdote that I couldn't really verify, verify, but I assume it's true. Murray made a bet with one of his law school professors, that Plessy v. Ferguson would be overturned within 25 years. Guess who was right? Guess who won that 10 bucks? It was Murray. He's amazing. How did he do, how did he do it at the university? He did amazing. Oh, good. He was elected chief justice in the Howard Court of Peers, whatever that means. And he graduated first in his class. Wow. At the time, and I assume now as well, it was common for students who graduated from various law schools to be offered graduate work at Harvard, but Murray was denied, despite the fact that he had a letter of recommendation from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. What? The balls you wow. have to have to deny someone who has a letter of recommendation from the, from the president. president. That's crazy. 
of your country, not some other country, your country. Wow, I wonder if there was any... <laughs> any racism or sexism involved? There was. <laughs> no, like, backlash. Yeah, if I'm the president and I write a letter of recommendation right. for someone, and then the, that university and... doesn't admit them, if it's, like, a direct slight, or I think it's a result of racism or sexism, your budget's getting slashed, bitch. <laughs> Harvard's private, so... Well, and you think, you probably think it's Harvard, right? The president or... Or somebody he knows is a huge investor at that time, right? Probably. Just the sheer balls. <laughs> the sheer yeah. Wow. Shriveled old man balls. <laughs> it takes to say no to the president. This is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's in like the top three most respected presidents in history. It's in, that's crazy to me. But don't worry. Murray bounces back. Uh, he ends up doing his graduate at UC Berkeley during his very prolific law career. Murray worked on cases to end segregation and sexism and all that sort of fun stuff. He would sometimes draw on psychological and sociology evidence as opposed to just legal evidence. And while he was at law school, his professors were like, no, 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 don't do this. But it's fine because Thurgood Marshall refers to Murray's book, State Laws on Race and Color, as the Bible of Brown v. Board of Education. Wow. New hot and iced sunrise batch coffee from Duncan. A bright and balanced, full-bodied blend, brewed so you can get summering from sunrise to sunset. And even after that, because that's when you can show off those string lights you hung in the backyard. Oh. Or rehung. Enjoy a medium, hotter, iced sunrise batch coffee for $2. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Exclusions apply. Why haven't you wow. heard of this person before? Yeah. It's, this doesn't make any it's sense. Racism, it's sexism and it's transphobia. He has ties to the President of the United States. He has ties to the First Lady of the United States. He has ties to Thurgood Marshall, who is the civil rights lawyer slash activist that we are mm -hmm. still learning about in textbooks, let alone people that I'm sure he was friends with at the time, that their name didn't stay throughout history as well in terms of historical names that we would know right off the top of our head. But at the time, were important right. public figures. If this is who he's schmoozing with, I'm sure that has to be the case. You don't just hang out yeah. at Eleanor Roosevelt's house and only know the White House. <laughs> you know, that one house. You know, the big white one on Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. You don't just gaudy. go there and hang out and not know anybody else. He probably knows most of FDR's cabinet. He probably knows all of these other people in the government. I'm baffled. I mean, and he was an activist starting in the 1940s doing things before Rosa Parks did and becoming like the first air quote, you know, woman to attend Howard University and like all these other things. How have we never heard of them before? Like it doesn't make any it's sense. It's baffling. This is why it's a conspiracy. This is why it fits our podcast exactly. Ugh. Oh my God. It's a conspiracy. Perfect tip. Super side note. Uh, my dad met Thurgood Marshall and That's I didn't know right. about this until 2021, a few months ago. <laughs> Wow. I forgot about this. We talked about So did about I. This. <laughs> Dad went to a pretty damn good high school in New York City. And one time, one of his high school classes, like, his teacher knew Thurgood Marshall. And so the class went down on, like, a field trip. And Thurgood Marshall gave them a lecture. And it wasn't like, wow. you know, buddy-buddy getting a beer with Thurgood Marshall. But also, it wasn't like 10,000 people in this audience. He yeah, was just, like, talking cool. to a class full of high school schmucks. <laughs> Continuing. In 1961, John Kennedy would appoint Polly Murray to the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. And Murray argued, eventually successfully, that the 14th Amendment covered sex as well as race. Wow. Murray coined the term Jane Crow and was working with <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and other names that we don't know and do know. Just out there kicking wow. legal ass. Taken legal names. And no one's ever heard of them. Right. Well, how many people in the last 10 years have you heard talk about Marsha P. Johnson that definitely mm -hmm. had no clue who the hell Marsha P. Johnson was until Same. they watched a documentary about her? So, Chip, maybe we need to just, you know, blast this everywhere. We do. They also just had a, did a documentary on Polly Murray, like, 2020? 2019? One of those. Good. 
So he was fighting racism. He was fighting sexism. He was unknowingly fighting transphobia. Just doing everything <laughs> that you could possibly be doing. And he was writing about how black women are the backbone of the civil rights movement. In 1965, he becomes the first black person to receive a doctorate in the science of law from Yale. How he insanely at... educated. <laughs> yeah. Obscenely educated. What was it? Howard Berkeley Yale? Denied from Harvard. He worked as an eventually tenured professor. I cannot keep listing everything he did because we would be here for literal hours. He just basically kept shouting, racism is evil and also sexism is evil. Let's not forget that. Biggest point of praise I can offer to Polly Murray is that in 1971, in the brief for Reed v. Reed, which was the first Supreme Court case to extend the 14th Amendment rights to women, Ruth Bader Ginsburg cited Polly Murray as a co-author in recognition of all the work he'd done. Notorious wow. RPG. And this is how I found out about Polly Murray, because some Tumblr post was like, hey, Ruth Bader Ginsburg loves this person you've never heard of. And I was like, huh, I've never heard of that person. Oh, it turns out he's amazing and also a trans man. Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and President Roosevelt. And Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And John F. Kennedy. How have you not heard this name before? Conspiracies. Conspiracies. Eventually, he left academia, and in 1977, he was ordained as an Episcopal priest. He died on July 1st, 1985, of pancreatic cancer. And in 2018, he was declared a saint of the Episcopal Church. What? What? Yeah. Apparently saints have calendar days, and his day is July 1st. And so, that's a summary. A very basic, bare-bones, bare-minimum summary of the life of Polly Murray. It sounds like a great life. I mean, he obviously accomplished a lot of good for this country. And because we don't know him, it just goes to show how apparent it still is. Or else he'd be in our school books, right. and we'd be reading about him. God, why aren't we? Even if you pretend he's just a lesbian, why aren't we learning about her? He's not. Right. He's clearly a trans man. We're at that section now. Okay, let's get into it. Here is an incomplete list of the evidence showing that Polly Murray was almost definitely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, transmasculine in some capacity. First off, he didn't talk about himself as homosexual or a lesbian. So calling him a lesbian is already just putting a label on him that he didn't want. So there goes right. any sort of moral high ground anyone ever had. Ways he did describe himself in letters and et cetera, et cetera. These are the ones that sound fairly genderqueer. He said that he had a he slash she personality. These are all direct quotes. Or, quote, maybe two got fused into one with parts of each sex. Quote, male head and brain, female-ish body... Mixed emotional characteristics. Here's a couple that are pointing to specifically transmasculine. Quote, One of nature's experiments. A girl who should have been a boy. Unquote. Do I need to continue with the episode? I mean, you should. Yes. yes. <laughs> we want to know more. He also called himself as having an, quote, inverted sex instinct. And also, quote, invertedly sexed. Unquote. I think wow. invertedly sexed is pretty, considering that they weren't using the word transgender. Trans, yeah. I feel like invertedly yes. sexed is the only way that he could think to describe himself. He described the women he was attracted to as extremely feminine and heterosexual. Even that in a quote of saying that the partner he prefers is heterosexual kind of goes against labeling him as queer. You know? yeah. Well, it goes against <laughs> labeling him as, as a lesbian. lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. In case just these sentences from him weren't enough, you want action? Okay, he went to multiple doctors to have himself examined to see if he was intersex. He was like, there's something going on here. Please check me. Am I actually a boy? Well, because he wanted an explanation for how he felt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was dismayed no. when they found that he was not intersex. Well, of course. He sought hormone replacement therapy. Okay, now the episode's done. <laughs> the episode is no. is in the, it swished, <laughs> half court, at the buzzer. It's done. Yeah, it is. 
If he sought out hormone replacement therapy. What else is he there? He was actively trying to transition. This person who has multiple degrees from some of the best universities in the entire country is seeking out hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, we don't have degrees from any of these universities, that's for sure. <laughs> I do my shock once a week. It's in the thigh. It's a little painful. He could and did pass as a teenage boy well into his 30s. Of course. When doing such passing as a teenage boy, he used masculine names such as Paul and Oliver and Pete. And this one's a fun one. I only found out about this one today. I didn't see it before. When Harvard denied him for being a woman, he replied, quote, Gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such a change has not been revealed to me, unquote, blah, 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 you should let me in. You don't go for to get hormone replacement therapy or seek out hormone replacement therapy if you are a lesbian point play period like there's no you, you can the other things you can say well some of those things are very gender fluid perhaps he just didn't really identify with either gender you don't seek out hormone replacement therapy unless you really feel strongly that you are born in the wrong body. I mean, lesbians go by more masculine names and stuff like that, but his direct quotes, like, no lesbian in, in history or even today would say or write or do any of those things. And the, the whole thing, the difference between being a lesbian and being trans is not only that you feel that are not in the right body, but most of the time that comes with a certain amount of dysphoria. Most lesbians are happy with their body. They like experiencing sex through their body. They are comfortable with their body. They just choose sexual partners of, of the same gender. And that goes for both gay men and lesbians. The difference is then... I'm not comfortable in my body and I don't want to be in this body. I want to be a different gender mm -hmm. is different than just being right. butch. And I feel like some people don't kind of see that difference between butch. Why can't you just be butch? Why do you have to transition? Because it's not the same. It turns out when AFABs are presented the question, if, if you could be a boy, if you could be in a boy's body, be have a penis, would you? And other people are mostly like, yeah, uh, I try it out for a few days, and, you know, sexism sucks, so it'd be cool to be a boy in that way, but I want to go back to being a girl. Turns out I'm the weirdo when I'm like, yes, I would absolutely get a penis. Why? What, what do you mean, turn back? No, <laughs> but it's easier to be a guy. Why, why would I want to come back? Turns out I'm the exception, right. not the rule. Other people are cis. <laughs> and I present to you, why would you ever call Polly Murray she, her? Or really even they, them. But at least that's... You're, you're, you're meeting me one-fourth of the way. I understand they, them, just because at the time there was no explicit way to say, oh, I am transgender, etc. But I feel like through his actions, he definitely got that across. <laughs> right. Well, and he actively described himself, you know, he, she personality, you know, fused in two parts of both sex. If you were to just hear that, that, you would think, okay, they, them let's use they, makes them. correct. Yeah. I'll give you, you they, know, them. Exactly. I will take it as a pitch. Right, 100%. 100%. It should be they, them, or he, him. It should not be anything else but those two. I would accept they, them, just because of the nature of his own descriptions of himself. And yeah, we'll never know what modern terminology he would have used if he was around now, with all the words we've got. But... In action and in direct quotes, we've got a very compelling argument. So when various historians, including the Polly Murray Center, the center focused on Polly Murray, uh, it admits, outright admits, that he was probably some sort of transmasculine thing, and then goes on to say in the same sentence, we will call her she, <laughs> infuriates me. Yeah. Yeah, why? I don't know. It, it's some sort of pretend, like we are honoring his memory by uh, by not erasing the struggle he had. So, so you're erasing the struggle by affirming the thing that he desperately wanted in life, and you're not continuing the oppression cycle by referring to him as a woman and a lesbian. Didn't call himself a yeah. lesbian. He hung out with Eleanor Roosevelt. Hanging out with Eleanor Roosevelt. You could make the argument that they were gals being pals, but... 
<laughs> they probably were. But we also know Eleanor Roosevelt had her hand in other baskets. <laughs> to, Yikes. To be exact. <laughs> they went to camp. I wasn't supposed to be a uh, a euphemism, but then it was, and uh, I'm kind of proud of it. You just stumbled into that one? It was yeah. pure luck. <laughs> also, just on the Smithsonian website, when talking about Murray, was citing a particular um, academic who talks about Murray as she, her, even though he's trans. Uh, the Smithsonian said, quote, transgendered man. And I'm, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You, come on. I'm, I'm just asking for grammar here. They're, tr- they're trying so hard, though, you know? <laughs> The Man of the Transgenderedness. Seems like a title. <laughs> that's my autobiography. That's my autobiog- That's my biography of Polly Murray. <laughs> and Naomi Simmons Thorne is the only academic I respect. Because she's the main one published on the internet saying, we should probably call him him. Yeah, yeah we should probably stop saying uh, he was a trans man, but also she was a trans man. That's very confusing. And every time cis people are like, I don't know the correct terminology, I'm like, I'm not surprised. I'm really not because of things like this. Well, there was some pretty high highs and some pretty low lows. I will give you that. Yeah. You were correct. Yeah. I think we're going to be talking about Polly Murray for a long time. (laughs) Me specifically ranting in rage. I think we're very baffled at every turn. Yeah. Yeah. In every aspect of his life, he was... And in awe. ...succeeding to a level that is historic, and yet, where is he in history? Yeah, has never been recognized for his merits, or also just respected by calling him what he is. We're finally starting to hear about him. Let's be honest, if he was in history books, he would be misgendered. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that is without, if there is a single book out there, any textbook at all whatsoever, it refers to him as she. So, lesbian? Let's take a vote. Raise your hands if lesbian. Nobody can see us raising Seeing no hands, hands, but there are no Seeing hands. no hands. <laughs> Please imagine, audience, if you will, zero hands being raised. <laughs> but plenty of side eye. So, transmasculine, a little bit, just sort of leaning? Yeah, 100%. Yes. The hormone replacement therapy and the invertedly, quote unquote, invertedly sexed very much took it over the line. And also you have to think that it it depends on the time period of these writings and things that he was saying and doing. So he could have said at the beginning, "I I feel like I'm fused one with parts of each sex, et cetera, et cetera, and he's in his 20s, and then later he's in his 30s, and he seeks hormone replacement therapy. It's all the the self-discovery and just in general, the gender and sexuality is a spectrum, and you don't know where you are or where you're going to end up. And I know that that's a very hard concept to grasp, that... You just don't know how gay you are until you hit (laughs) rock-bottom gay. (laughs) It's fine. I'm a passionate ally. Once you realize that these things exist and you start exploring them, you start learning more and then you start learning more about yourself. And it's it's Mm -hmm. just self-discovery and that takes a long time. People are discovering other things about themselves all the time. So one of the arguments that the people make with the she her bit is that it seems like he sort of came to terms with his gender and so he landed on woman. I don't think coming to terms with your struggle describes realizing you're cis. Coming to terms yeah. with your struggle just means he didn't feel like there was anything available to him at the time that he was interested enough in to pursue to right what he perceived as a wrong. There right. are trans men now who don't want to participate in top surgery or bottom surgery, either because they're comfortable or because the surgeries are not highly enough developed for it to be anything resembling what they would want it to be. And so they'd rather wait and see how surgery progresses, see how science progresses to make that happen. He gave up. He gave up. And yeah, he not gave because up. he he changed his mind, but because he felt like there was no out for him. It's also a lazy cop out to just 
telling calling him what he is <laughs> and admitting that you're doing the wrong thing that's what it sounds like to me that sounds like a lazy ass cop out what no that's ridiculous it's just so intellectually dishonest to admit that he seems transmasculine but i'm gonna call her she her this isn't a seam situation. This isn't we perceive him as this. This is him saying. Directly saying and stating it. Seeking out hormone, hormone replacement yeah. and all these other things. Like, this isn't just we're putting this on him. This is the facts of his life. <laughs> this concludes our Secret Trans History episode of our Pride series. We hope that you had fun learning about all of these people, especially Polly Murray, who I'm sure we will be bringing up time and time again on this show. I just love him so much. <laughs> so apparently everyone when he was alive loved him too. Yeah. Daniel Marshall, John Kennedy, you buds, everyone writing letters of recommendation, Roosevelt. This sounds like somebody we should be reading about and educated about. Until next time, I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. Call me a lesbian, I dare you. You just listened to the Deep Dark Truth Podcast. See you next time. And remember, your local cryptids want to meet you. Why? Broke out overnight. When you can... Why? When you can. (laughs) Taste the thrill with Coca-Cola and Six Flags. Save up to 50% on tickets with promo code COKE at SixFlags.com. This isn't just basketball. This is the NBA playoffs. And with William Hill Sportsbook, you can dial up the playoff intensity from the palm of your hand. Just download the William Hill mobile app and your first bet of up to $500 is risk-free using promo code RADIORF. New users only. Must be 21 years or older and present in Virginia to bet. Paid in free bets. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem? Call, text, or chat our confidential and toll-free helpline at 1-888-532-3500. William Hill Sportsbook. Proud partner of the NBA. Let's make it interesting.